uh, let's start. Um, first of all, thanks for inviting us to, to give this uh, talk here in the, in the Painless and Windmill Summer School. Today, we are going to talk a bit about UAV communication challenges. Um, my name is Christian Raffelsberger. I'm a project manager and senior researcher at Lakeside Labs Klagenfurt in Austria. And my colleague, Eamon, will introduce also himself. Yeah, I'm Ayman Fahreddin. I'm also from Lakeside Labs. Uh, I work there as a senior researcher where I focus my research on, uh, on cellular connected drone systems. So uh, thank you for inviting us and I'm happy to give this lecture today together with Christian Habsberger. Thank you for accepting. <laughs> Welcome. Good, maybe because probably uh, most of you don't know who Lakeside Labs is. So we are a nonprofit research organization um, we are partially owned by the University of Klagenfurt in Austria and also our research director, Christian Bettstetter, is a professor there at the university. Um, the, the basic idea of the Lakeside Labs is to somehow bridge the gap between university and applied research or, and industry. So we are doing a lot of applied research with several companies and also a lot of projects together with the university. Um, you also see that somehow where we are situated, we are in this uh, Lakeside Park, uh, which is also in Klagenfurt, and basically it hosts, I think, now over a thousand people working in different ICT domains, um, different smaller companies, but also big companies like Infineon uh, are situated there. So this is actually a, a very nice spot to work. Um, also, you see, um, or actually you don't see, but <laughs> I marked it, there are some... Um, grounds where we can actually fly outdoors. So some outdoor test areas where we have special permissions to fly with our drones. And also there is now, um, it's not on the picture, it's a new drone hall that was built by the University of Klagenfurt where we can do some indoor drone flights. They also have an OptiTrack system, um, which basically are some really good um, infrastructure facilities that we can use for our research. Um, we are not just working with drones, so drones is one of the application areas. Basically, um, our main research um, topic are self-organizing network systems with different applications, drones, but also sensor networks, uh, emergency communication, or uh, we also have a, um, a strong um, research background in swarm intelligence. Good, um, that's all about the company. Now let's start. Um, to today's talk. Uh, first, I will give a brief introduction and some examples of drone applications and um, focus a bit on drone communication using ad hoc networks, which I would say could be seen as somehow like the traditional approach um, or at least the approach that has been used first. And then my colleague Eamon will give um, an overview about cellular connected UAVs and some different uh, topics uh, there. Good, uh, let me start uh, first of all um, with the different applications. I mean, probably you have heard um, drones are often named in the media as one very um, promising application or like, let's say a, a tool uh, that could be used for different um, jobs, um, monitoring of, of bridges or of, of other infrastructure, um, also maybe an emergency response operations for search and rescue tasks. Um, also, there, is, um, there has been some research on how, how to provide connectivity using drones, so that drones are basically forming some, some kind of aerial infrastructure to provide connectivity for ground users. Um, one, one other example are the delivery of, is the delivery of goods. I mean, you probably heard that Amazon and other big companies are testing um, these kind of applications. Um, the, the important thing here is to say that all these applications are rather different. Uh, first of all, in terms of the, the, the areas that need to be covered, if you think about a, a search and rescue task, which is usually small to maybe mid-sized, um, up to the delivery of goods where you want to cover a, a whole city or even a, a whole country. And also this means you need, um, your system needs a different uh, number of drones. Um, we are mostly um, focusing on multi-drone systems um, whereas I would say the commercial um, 
the commercial applications now usually use single drone systems. That's with a few exceptions, the, the focus currently. So you can buy one drone, you can control that drone or have it flying in some semi-automatic automatic mode, uh, do, it, do its task and then land. Um, I would say from a research perspective, actually the, the more uh, intriguing um, applications are those where you actually need um, more drones, um, maybe a swarm of drones. So like really a, a large number of drones that are uh, working independently of, of a central control that are distributed and perform this task faster or more robust. Um, so thus communication is a very important um, pre-requirement to, to, to um, run such a drone system, multi-drone system. Um, if you think about um, the applications, you have to identify basically or classify the applications. So as I said, they're different. Um, this is called like mission parameters, um, depending on the area size, uh, depending also on the terrain or the environment. This has some implications on the basically the physical requirements of the drones. For instance, if you want to fly in urban areas, usually you need to have some kind of redundancy. So let's say, um, octocopter systems where you can actually uh, where, where one or I think several motors can actually fail and still the drone does not crash into someone in a rural area rural area this is usually not such a big deal um, another important parameter that is usually um, apart from the from the application itself is, is what is actually the purpose of the of the drone system um, is it is it um, is it used for for sensing so such as in a search and rescue environment, you have a lot of sensors there. You have visual sensors, maybe other sensors, laser scans or, or um, infrared cameras and other things that you actually need to perform your mission. Or is it more about just to control the drone? So for instance, if you have a delivery use case, basically you're just interested where are the drones and you want to basically um, notify others about their existence, also have tasks like um, 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 avoiding uh, crashing into each other. So these are the, the like kind of different tasks. Then also some system parameters that, that come from these re application requirements, like uh, what is the best suited um, network mode? Um, do you have to build your own infrastructure? Is it somewhere where there is no existing communication technology? Um, or can you uh, use existing um, infrastructure such as a cellular network? And also, as I said before, the number of drones. Um, and then um, if you think about the network requirements, you also have different types of traffic. You have some, some real-time requirements. For instance, uh, if you want to track a target, usually you want to have the, the information about this target in real time. Um, and maybe there are other um, applications such as for the delivery, it's, it's okay if the drones send the beacon every 10 seconds or so that you know the location of. Also depends a bit like where the drone is flying, but this is more like a periodic um, um, traffic type, or maybe it's even delay tolerant. So delay tolerant means basically the drones, they can um, collect some information and maybe when they are near each other or near um, some kind of offloading station, they can provide this data, but you don't need it in real time. And obviously the, the, the quality of service parameters that are important for every network design, throughput delay and other things, a bit error rate, stuff like this. And this all has effects um, on how you would actually design such a drone system, what information uh, you, you want to transmit and also like what communication infrastructure you have available or not and what you have to provide on the drones. Um, if you look um, at some qualitative requirements, you can also see that there are differences between different um, applications. Um, so for instance, if you look at, at search and rescue, usually there is a, a big need to actually communicate um, the data, the collected data to some ground personnel, to the re response units. Um, the drones do not just fly for the sake of it, but they really have to provide some information for some, some person on the ground. Um, also, you have to have connectivity to some decision-making entity. That means there usually you have some kind of a mission control. Someone is sending tasks to the drone system, and then these tasks maybe need to be distributed among single drones. Um, or you just have to make the drones um, be included in some, some uh, system that you basically know, okay, there are drones flying, because in such a rescue missions, also helicopters may, may fly and other um, 
other um, aircrafts so that you don't uh, collide with each other. Um, most of the times the connectivity and search and rescue between the devices is not as important. Um, so usually it's, they may act as, a, as some kind of relay, but then also the main goal is to provide some connectivity to ground personnel. So, so in this case, usually it's not that important. On the other hand, if you, for instance, look at an example like a construction, um, so basically the idea here is that drones, they could construct uh, some building, like they could um, help to, to carry things um, when you build a skyscraper or other, other buildings. So there, have been, there has been research in this direction. And there, usually the, the connectivity between the devices is very important because they need to coordinate each other uh, with each other. They need to have a very um, precise uh, knowledge about the location so that they don't crash into each other. And also that they basically can coordinate in, for instance, lifting up one, one big, big part together. So there has been a lot of work in this uh, basic um, coordination and control of a, of a swarm of drones. Um, but as I said, the communication requirements are totally different. So this is really, um, really um, a thing that you have to take in mind when you design such a system. So um, this is basically, there's a differentiation between some mandatory requirements where you would say, this is in a search and rescue application, this is always needed. And then maybe there is a base uh, case to case decision where you need some of the other requirements. This is, is basically, it's important to know that uh, when you design your system. And similar as I, as I already talked before about this, um, it's obviously also good if you know um, the, the type of traffic that the application will generate and the requirements. Like, is it a real-time tracking, for instance, for some, uh, for some monitoring tasks? You could have other monitoring tasks, for instance, where you just want to map a, a certain area. Uh, where, where you have no real-time requirements and this affects the, the, the choice of communication and also the, basically the challenges. Um, yeah, and this is also true for the other, uh, for the other application areas. Um, now I want to um, give you a, a bit um, an insight into one um, um, scenario that we looked into in, in several projects and where we um, designed the system. Um, so the basic tasks is uh, a, search and a search and rescue scenario uh, where you want to basically cover a certain area and, and, and find people there or find important um, events, detect events. Could also be like, a, for instance, a, a forest fire and you want to actually know where are the different fires on the ground and you want to, to give this information to some ground personnel. In, in these situations, usually you cannot really rely on the cellular infrastructure. I mean, it may be available, but chances are that it has been um, disrupted uh, because of the disaster at hand or that it's overloaded or that just you're in, in, a, in a very rural um, area. If you think about a forest fire somewhere at the mountain, I mean, Austria has some, some areas that are not very well inhabited. So there are no people, obviously there is no infrastructure, communication infrastructure. So there you have to rely on, on ad hoc communication. And also what is very important, I would say in general, but, but especially in such disaster situations, you need to have um, a system that is um, very easy to, 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 to operate, to set it up very quickly. And this also holds true for the communication. So for instance, First, um, planning the optimal um, placement of your ground stations, of your um, base stations is, is not possible in such an event. You don't have the time to do that. So you may just need to basically um, put up the drones, um, let them start, and then on the fly adapt your, your communication infrastructure. Um, and yeah, this is important. So because the, 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 the response personnel has other tasks to do. Um, I want to show a short video. I have no idea if it will actually work well. Um, but um, I think you should at least get the basic, basic message. So we build a, 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 a demonstration showing such a search and rescue operation. We have um, several drones um, that fly basically autonomously. Um, they get a wire control. Uh, software, they get the basic area that has to be covered, and then they will um, divide this task among each other. Uh, they have a camera. Um, um, each of the drones has a camera and is actually collecting data. 
Uh, for an overview picture only, like still images are, are sent, just to give a, 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 an overview about the situation. Um, and so as the drones fly, uh, one of the drones may detect a target. I mean, this is also application dependent. Um, in our case, we just had this little red um, jacket uh, representing some victim. And as soon as one drone finds the victim, the others will actually coordinate to form a relay chain so that the information can be sent back to the command control station. And actually, this is the important thing. So the communication is not always available, but actually when you have the information at hand, you start to, to send it to the control station. Um, so here the drones are used basically for sensing, but also to provide um, connectivity to the ground users and to send this collected data. Um, so, and now I want to give some details about um, this, the multimedia streaming um, that we did for, 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 this, uh, for this application. Um, so basically, we used uh, Wi-Fi 802.11 um, as, as communication technology um, in, in the ad hoc mode. And um, the, the, the basic system does not need any Mac layer modifications. I mean, it's, it's possible and there are existing works that modify the Mac layer, for instance, to provide some acknowledgement mechanism, which is usually not available in, in multicast um, communication in Wi-Fi. Uh, but we, we have an application layer approach. And we also, I also want to show some, some results of our experimental evaluation. So actually we, 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 we tested, like we implemented the system and then tested it with several drones. Um, there are two different setups that we, that we looked into. Um, one is, the, one is um, a point to multi-point um, communication. That means we have one drone that sends um, a multicast video stream to uh, a group of users on the ground. And um, so all the communication is, is basically multicast. And then we have a second scenario, which is the multi-point to point to multi-point scenario. So basically uh, here we have several drones. So the drones, as I said before, they could fly on different areas and they could cover different um, um, yeah, parts of, 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 of your, of your um, operational area. And they send a unicast stream to one, one gateway. So the gateway should be located somewhere closer to the ground users. And this, um, this gateway then um, will then multicast also all the streams, all the received streams um, to the users on the ground. And the users on the ground, the, they can actually select if they are more interested into the, um, the, the video from, from, from this drone or the other drone. So they can basically select um, and, and, and change change the video. Um, as I said before, in multicast uh, streaming, basically, or in multicast communication, you have no acknowledgement mechanism. And this makes it quite um, um, challenging uh, because you don't have any feedback whether your um, stream has been received on the, or by the users or not, or by the user application or not. Um, so basically, um, as I said before, we have um, a group of, of, of drones that unicast different streams to one gateway. Um, this gateway drone then um, transcodes all the received video to a low quality version and multicasts all of these low quality videos to the ground. On the ground, you have different um, users and they are interested in, in different um, videos. So they select uh, which video they are interested in and this video is then sent in a higher quality. Um, so basically, you see that here. You have, in this case, we have three three groups. Um, so then we use the normal um, RTP, like normal, like the the, the well known RTP uh, protocol to actually transmit the videos, and also we we gain um, information, um, acknowledgement information using RTCP. Um, and with this, um, also we estimate the, the the receiver link condition. So this is important actually to adapt then later the videos. Um, the, the, the idea in, 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 our, in our system is that if you have a group of users, uh, you could select one of the users as a, like a primary user, and only this user will um, provide you some feedback about whether frames or packets have, have been received or not. Because if, if every user would send um, feedback, then this would just overwhelm the channel and then you not have a very uh, high good put because of, of all this acknowledgement data. And especially about uh, because of the retransmissions you have. Um, 
So basically, there is um, there are certain designated um, nodes that will actually provide feedback, and based on this feedback, retransmissions are are performed. And also uh, based on the the link conditions, we also adapt the rate in terms of um, uh, frames per second or quantization parameters or resolution. Um, so we tested this um, with uh, three drones and uh, four ground users. And the drones were set up in a certain way. You see it here in the in the picture. So they were flying, um, and then they were also moving away from the from the ground users to simulate varying channel conditions, and um, also the drones um, and the gateway the distances were were um, varied just to have this this variation. Um, we have um, on on our drones. We have um, obviously one camera, also one one Nvidia Jetson board that is doing the transcoding and all the processing, and a high power Wi-Fi card um, with up to uh, three antennas actually to to transmit the data between the drones and from the drone to the ground users. I want to skip all the details about how to select the um, the actual nodes and, and how exactly the feedback works. And there is um, also an, an adaptive um, approach to reselect the, the group leader if, 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 if leaders, um, if the, if the, first of all, if the channel conditions change or if, uh, if um, um, a group member leaves the group. Um, this you can read in the paper, but just to show you the, the, the actual um, results. So if we look at the PSNR, which is an objective measure for the quality of the video, um, so the higher the PSNR, the, the, the better the, the quality of the video. You see that the adaptive approach, which is here in red, is, is, is most of the times performing best. And also if you look, I hope this is somehow transmitted well. If you look at the videos on the right side, you see a low quality version. Uh, in the middle, a high quality version. So using 256 kilobits on a six megabit um, channel. And on the right side, there is our approach where we have this um, application layer feedback, the, the, the selected um, selective acknowledge um, retransmissions and also the rate adaptations. And most of the time you also see it visually that the, the, the picture, the uh, received picture, the video is, 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 has a higher quality. So this is for the point to multipoint video analysis where you only have one hop between the drone and the ground users. Uh, we also did the same experiment with two hops, and there you actually have really big troubles in transmitting all the data because of these two hops. Um, you especially see that in the in the middle, where there are a lot of artifacts because um, the bandwidth is not high enough, or there are too many lost packets. Thus, you have frame drops or artifacts. While on the right side, you should see that also here the the video quality is is, is actually better than the others. Good. So this was one uh, specific um, um, example of, of how to use drones for multimedia streaming. Um, in our um, system, we used a rather old standard, uh, 802.11a. We also did some um, measurements with AC, um, just to compare a, a, a newer uh, Wi-Fi standard. And we also evaluated different settings. So there are certain parameters you can change the number, obviously the number of spatial streams, the channel bandwidth, and also the modulation schemes. So the so these are parameters that you can actually select. And when you, when you look at the, the actual throughput data, so we also had just two drones flying um, away from each other. So they started like roughly 10 meters apart from each other. And then they just uh, flew in different directions with a rather low speed. Um, I think it was like two or three meters per second. So not fast. Um, and you see that basically, as you would expect, obviously when the distance is short, um, um, is closer, the, the bandwidth is rather well, but you also see that um, actually the 80 megahertz channel degrades quite fast. Um, and after like roughly 100, 150 meters, actually it's better to use a, a lower uh, lower bandwidth because the, the, the signal is basically more robust. And the same is true for the delay. You see that you have a big um, delay spikes um, after like 250 to 300 meters. And also you see that the that general um, connectivity is, is larger if you use a lower if you use a lower channel bandwidth. The takeaway message is not actually the, the concrete results, but um, the takeaway me message is that you see that the, the basic um, performance of the network is varying a lot um, based on the distance 
here not so much about the mobility because we had like rather, um, as I said, slow speeds. But if you imagine you would have, um, this is just a link speed, the device to device communication, direct communication with the Wi-Fi. Um, if you think about having multiple drones uh, forming some kind of ad hoc network, maybe using some kind of routing protocol on top, some ad hoc routing protocol on top, or using this, this mesh, uh, mesh mode where you also have some multi-hop connectivity, uh, there you actually have a lot of, of, of problems with the mobility, with varying link conditions. Um, the topology changes quite drastically. And actually this is, in, in, in most practical systems, this would be a real big problem. And I think this is also a reason why we don't see um, like swarms of drones um, um, a lot um, in, apart from research and apart from some selected um, applications like these, these drone shows where they have this light um, this light shows with drones. Um, and, and actually, if you think about it um, in general, you have several pros and cons. If you think about um, ad hoc networking, not just Wi-Fi, but also other um, um, ad hoc networking communication technologies, um, the, the probably the biggest advantage is that you can use, um, there is all the hardware is available, it's implemented in, in many devices. Also, if you think about the ground users, usually on the laptop, you have a Wi-Fi module or other Bluetooth modules and things like this. Um, adaptability is also um, um, a pro, I mean, compared to other, um, for instance, cellular technology. I mean, it's easy to adapt Wi-Fi and to come up with your own protocols. You can change the Mac layer if you need to. This is not, not possible uh, in, in, in other uh, infrastructure um, technologies. Uh, you can use free ISM bands. That's actually a, a big, big thing. Um, and yeah, as I said, also comes with this commodity hardware. It's, it's usually low cost. I mean, those modules now uh, come for a few euros. Um, on the on the downsides, you have, um, as I said before, a limited coverage. So the quality um, the quality of the channel degrades quite drastically with um, higher ranges. And also, multi hub communication is not really a solution because you have really problems with scalability. So multi hub paths they work well maybe for two hops, but starting with three hops or more hops. So if you think about this this Wi-Fi example, if you would like to cover like two kilometers. And you have basically a link to link, uh, sorry, a device to device link of roughly 500 meters. You would already need three hops, and this would be quite actually to also degrade the, the communication. I don't think that you would have a much good put on such a three hop network. Um, also, the antenna orientation is very important. Um, probably you don't see it on the pictures. We saw it um, briefly in the video. So for this setup, we used a special um, antenna orientation that some of our colleagues uh, came up um, um, earlier when they did actually the first experiments with drones. So they, they just used some, some, some routers or some Wi-Fi modules and they, they did some first initial experiments and the, um, the basic communication um, performance was really bad. And then they found out that they actually have to use a certain antenna orientation um, just to have um, a good coverage, both in, in the aerial space, so, so to say horizontally between drones, but at the same time also provide connectivity for the ground users. And if you think about um, different roles um, that the drones could have and, and different mobility scenarios, this is also important that basically your antenna setup is somehow um, adapted to the specific scenario you have. This is, this is also something that you have to take in mind. And um, the good thing of an ISM band is, is everyone can use it. The bad thing is everyone can use it. So you have to um, think about interference. Um, usually it's not such a big deal in rural area and also in the air, up in the air, especially in higher altitudes. Also interference is not a, a, a very big issue, but still it, it could happen as I said before. Also scenarios and you have to keep it in mind. Okay, good. A basic introduction and, and the focus on, on ad hoc networking technologies. As I said before, I could say this could be like the traditional approach that people started with when they were um, building drone communication systems. Um, my colleague Eamon will now um, talk about cellular connected drones. And I think it's best if we also switch the presentations and if he can share his screen now yes thank you christian let's take it from here i will 
probably need to stop. So yes, did you? I stopped, yeah. All right, can you now see my presentation? Yes. Perfect. So uh, my part is going to focus on, this, on cellular connected drones. So Christian presented some generalities and how also to use Wi-Fi together with multi -hub, with multi -hub architectures in order to, uh, to transmit information, to exchange information among drones or, or also between drones and ground stations. And this part will focus on kind of using that, but rather with true infrastructure, true cellular infrastructure. So the main motivation is like, why actually do we need to connect drones to cellular networks? So first of all, it's uh, thanks to this wide area connectivity. So uh, as Christian said before, like we can, we can for example, use multi-hub uh, multi architectures, but then it doesn't work that well when we go beyond two hubs, like for three and beyond, it's not, it doesn't, work that well, but for some drone applications, when the, the the area that we need to cover is quite large, when it's, uh, let's say, uh, on a city scale, or when we're using that for border control, or an area that is much, much wider, then we would need to rely more on, on existing infrastructure rather than using multi-hub systems. Another, uh, another reason is, uh, in terms of having an entity of trust for improved safety, which is the mobile operator, and also using license spectrum improves security and reliability that might be, might be a big requirement for some drone applications. Also low latency is, is key, is a key parameter, is a key parameter design for multi-drone systems, uh, especially for applications that are uh, latency sensitive and and then the drones actually can take several roles in cellular network they can be used as a, as base station as mobile base stations as relay or as mobile devices so this is something that christian presented before why do we need multiple drones for time critical missions and for covering a wide area and also for when there is a lack of uh, infra infrastructure that we need to let's say uh, overcome within within a short time range with with a fast deployment of drones. So before before we talk, we, uh, I want to talk a bit about the vertical coverage of cellular networks. So traditionally, cellular networks were designed to serve ground users that are on the ground in buildings, and that's it. But lately, there was uh, the focus was shifted a bit towards covering the sky with cellular networks, and this was of high interest for uh, high interest for uh, for uh, for airlines to provide good connectivity to to on to to onboard passengers, and the this actually needed let's say kind of an upgrade or a shift in. Of, uh, of the infrastructure, because as you know, like uh, since most antennas here to serve ground users are directed to, are oriented to the ground, to serve these airplanes for that are above 3000 meters, they needed, let's say extra infrastructure. So they needed to, in, uh, in continental flights, like within continental Europe or con uh, mainland US, mainland China, the idea was to deploy several base stations with antennas that are up tilted to serve to serve such airplanes. So this this is a costly deployment, obviously, and also it works only when the airplanes are at their cruise altitude, when they are quite high in the sky. But then the drones are kind of in this gray area in between, so uh, they cannot be served with such infrastructure that is for for airplanes. And also the, let's say the, the business models are not there yet to provide a, a dedicated infrastructure for drones. So the idea is that drones that are flying between 50 to around 300 meters height, they basically need to be served with existing infrastructure. So 
No, first of all, I'm going to talk about the promising throughput figures uh, that we that we observed while uh, evaluating experimentally uh, cellular connected UAVs before moving to talk about what are the main integration issues that we that the, the drones or that researchers face while integrating drones into such cellular systems. So first of all, since I'm going to be presenting uh, some experimental results, uh, I would like to talk a bit about how to test cellular network performance. So uh, there are several measurement tools like for G-Test, uh, Nemo Handy, or Cell versus Wi-Fi from LMS Lab MID. But most of these tools have quite several issues. They are usually proprietary, not freely available, or most of the time they lack fine-grained measurements. So my colleagues at Lakeside Labs de uh, developed this cellular drone measurement tool, uh, which we call a CDMT, and which is available for academic use on this link. So this tool provides uh, metrics uh, related to, to the received power, uh, received signal quality, signal to, to noise ratio, in addition to the throughput, whether using UDP or TCP, latency, the GPS coordinates, and also the cell identifier of the serving cell and the neighboring cell cells. So this tool for us was extremely important. And thanks to this tool, like actually we uh, uh, we managed to to write at least like five or six papers with, with such results. So I'm going to uh, here to show this promising throughput figures, uh, we've done several experiments, like one with LTE Advance and one with 5G. So the one with LTE Advance was done in collaboration with the with Magenta, which is an Austrian mobile operator that is under uh, Deutsche Telekom. And we perform our measurements right next to, to Lakeside Labs and the University of Klagenfurt campus. So this is basically the, the southwest part of Klagenfurt. This is the area where we were allowed to fly. So Christian sh uh, shown that before. And these are the locations of the base of the base stations that are deployed by, by Magenta. So what is worth noting here is that we were use, we were connecting the drone to the commercial uh, to the commercial network that is deployed by, by this mobile operator. So the, these measurements were collected, I think, in end 2018, early 2019. At that time, it, the, the network was LTE advanced, uh, running the 3GPP release 13, with carrier aggregation of up to 60 megahertz, both in the uplink and the downlink. Most antennas were at 30 meters height with 20 watt max, uh, maximum transmit power. And the drone that we used was this Aztec Pelican that was carrying a Sony Xperia phone that was running this CDMT app that allowed us to collect all the all the all the data. So for this for this flight trajectory, we flew over the same flight ground flight path, but we flew over different different heights. So we flew. At 150 meters, that was scenario four, 150 and 10 meters. So 10 meters would be considered as a quasi ground scenario because we couldn't actually just uh, fly at a lower, at lower altitude because of uh, the GPS accuracy and the difficulty of maneuvering flights when the, when the height is less than five meters. And also since I'm going to show it afterwards. We present some results, especially in terms of handovers. And uh, handover is kind of speed, uh, speed sensitive. So as we wanted to, to provide kind of a fair comparison between, uh, between aerial, aerial user equipment and ground users, we preferred to fly actually at this altitude so that that way we can actually keep the exact same speed that we had in the in the aerial scenario for the experimental setup that 
that we had with 5G. So we also did that, I think, in uh, the end of 2019. And at that time, the same mobile operator had uh, a very sparse deployment of uh, of uh, 5G of 5G and our ba base stations. So, and this uh, this case was particularly interesting because we flew our drone right next to a 5G base station that was just by itself there. And there was no other 5G base station in, in around 30 to 40 kilometers radius. So this was really interesting in terms of uh, uh, checking what is the achievable throughput of 5G when, when a drone, I mean, when a drone is served by 5G, uh, given that there is no uh, no in, no interference, no intercell interference, since that was actually the only uh, the only base station running 5G and R at uh, at 3.7 gigahertz. So this network was running the 3GPP release 15 with frequencies between 3.7 and 3.8 gigahertz. Uh, the, ante the antenna was a massive 64 by 64 massive MIMO antenna, and the modulation was the same as uh, before for LTE advanced, 256 km for downlink and 64 for, for uplink. And also here, uh, my colleagues at Lexad Labs needed to upgrade a bit this CDMT app to be able to collect also 5G, 5G data. So I'm going to start with this 5G case with no 5G interference. So we flew the drone uh, vertically from zero to 150 meters and also horizontally at 30 and 100 meters. And we showed the 4G and 5G downlink throughputs and uplink throughputs as well. So if we focus first on this vertical flight from zero to 150 meters, uh, first of all, the drone was simply connected to, to 4G. Then at some point, it, start, uh, it started getting connection from to, to 5G with very high throughput of at least 600 megabits per second. But then it started like dropping and then rising again. And in terms of average, I think it was, if we only consider 5G, it was, the average was 500 to 600 megabits per second. And I'm going to explain later why we had all these drops. So you can see clearly that the, the 5G downlink throughput was much, much higher than the, than the 4G one, while the uplink was quite similar. Uh, if it, as you can see here in these uh, curves that are in pink and in, in light blue. On the other hand, when we, when we flew the drone horizontally at 100 meters, the 5G downlink was quite stable, uh, the downlink throughput, and it was always, most of the time, let's say, beyond 600 megabits per second. And this is really interesting because we should keep in mind that there was no intercell interference for the, five, for the 5G case, which is actually uh, interesting. Intercell interference, as I'm gonna show afterwards, is one of the most determinant factors in terms of downlink throughputs for cellular connected drones. So here we can, uh, uh, I can show like uh, some, some, some results on throughput. So uh, we did, as I said, we did three experiments like a lift off from zero to 150 meters, a horizontal flight at 30 meters and another one at 100 meters. And here we also show the throughput figures for downlink and uplink and also the number of handovers. So the maximum throughput for downlink for the liftoff was 742, which is, let's say we can, we can call this as an achievable data rate because in currently deployed 5G networks, we would not be able to achieve this because of the interference. But then what is interesting is that the uplink is actually not not that better than the, four, than the 4G one. So in terms of uplink, we always have an average of 40 to 50 megabits per second. While for the downlink, when we have 5G, when we have 5G connectivity, I mean, this was uh, 
uh, not standalone 5G, but still there was a big improvement in terms of downlink throughput. Now I'm going to talk about the now I'm going to talk more about the integration issues and to try also to explain the previous results. So as I said before, the main problem that drones are facing is the fact that they are not served by the side by the by the main lobe. So the main lobe of antennas is actually direct to, to the ground users. And since the drones are flying at a higher at a higher altitude than than where the antennas are, then they are served only by the by the side lobes. So if we consider this basic scenario in which we only have, let's say, just two base stations, like base station A and base station B, uh, a drone that is, for example, located at this point, at this uh, at this position P1, even if it's at a closer vicinity to base station A, maybe it gets connected to base station B because it gets more power thanks to this side lobe that is there, that is uh, straightly directed to the drone at this position. But then, if when the drone flies from P from position P1 to position P2, which is not I mean, which is not that farther away, it gets it switches to base station A and it switches back to base station B when it's at position three. This can be also observed when the drone is flying horizontally, let's say from P2 to P4. And this creates, this is one of the main problems actually that, that, that we face when integrating drones to cellular, cellular systems in general, is this set association problem and also the problems that we, we have with multiple handovers. The second problem is, is interference in cellular connected drones. So, Cellular networks rely on frequency reuse. And for that, like it was designed for, as I said before, just for ground users. So if we take, for example, this scenario here, this downlink scenario, for like in for every color I show, for example, a frequency that is reused, let's say the frequency that is supposed to be in this cell is going to be re reused in some other cells, let's say in the second uh, in the second hub. But the idea is that there are, let's say, buildings in between and this, and then uh, ground users will not be that much affected by such intercell interference. However, when drones are flying quite at quite high high altitudes, they have line of sight links to several base stations and. Some of these base stations, some of these base stations are actually run uh, operating on the exact same frequency with this frequency reuse, which means that if this drone is normally supposed to be served by this base station here, it is suffering from downlink interference from all the other base stations that it has line of sight to, and that are operating on the same frequency. On the other hand, for the uplink. It's again the main problem, is, which is the fact that the drone has again line of sight to several base to several cells operating on the same frequency, and that makes the drone impact highly the uplink, uh, the uplink throughput of ground users that are in several cells. So, for example, this drone when it's served by this cell, by this uh, base station cell, it creates. It generates uplink interference to this ground user here, to these ones, these ones here, and eventually also to some other flying drones. And this also explains like why, in this result that I've shown before with 5G, the throughputs were the downlink throughputs were really high, and that was because we did not have uh, at that location, we did not have all these uh, other base stations that are running the same on, that are reusing the same frequency. Here, I'm going to show some performance results, but more for LTE now. So for LTE, the average throughput that we observed in downlink was 20 megabits per second, and in the uplink was 40 megabits per second. And this is, again, very different than what we usually observe for ground users. So for ground users, usually the we, we usually have a higher 
downlink throughput than the uplink. While for, for drones, it was actually the opposite, which is, let's say, which is partly a good news because drones usually need more, uh, more capacity on the uplink. Because let's, uh, let's imagine the scenario that Christian was talking about before of drones that are transmitting a video, a video stream to a ground station for a search and rescue mission. So they will be, if they are connected to the cellular, to the cellular network, this video would be transmitted on the uplink, which is quite interesting for us here because the uplink is actually quite good. But you shouldn't forget that it's going to impact badly the uplink of ground users and also of uh, of drones, especially if we have a, a multi drone or a, a multi drone system or a swarm, because at that moment they will they will be like kind of interfering with each other a lot, and that would uh, and the uplink at that time would. Uh, would suffer some degradation. But then again, just to show that the, the interference, the intercell interference is what determines more the downlink, uh, we, we, we measured actually the correlation between the throughput and the SNR, and also between the downlink throughput and the SIR, the signal to interference ratio, at different heights. So. As you can see, especially for, for SNR, like the, the correlation is always, you know, it's always quite high, like uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.6 at 50 meters, at 100, and even 0 0.8 at 150 meters. But then for the SIR, for the signal to interference ratio, it's quite low for low altitudes for 10 and 50 meters, but it gets much, much higher at 150 meters so at 150 meters, the correlation between the downlink throughput and the SIR is much, much higher than what we observe at the ground or at lower altitudes, which proves again that the, that the downlink throughput is highly impacted by the interference. Here, I'm gonna show some other aspects of uh, these integration issues, which is the cell association. So here, uh, this is the same uh, evaluation scenario that I've shown before related to a drone connected to the LTE advanced network in, um, uh, in the outskirts of Planenfort. So with the blue crosses here, we show what is the ground, what is the ground pad that the, the, the drone is fly, flying over. And these red triangles show the the base stations that the drone gets connected to in the ground scenario and while flying at different altitudes. So in the beginning, you see that the, the drone was actually most of the time connected to this base station here. And at some point it gets connected to one, another one that is a bit further, but you can see here at some point that there is quite some line of sight because here it's mostly just fields. There are no buildings in between. When the drone flies at, at 50 meters, it gets connected to a much farther base station, but still we have only two. But then when it flies at 100 meters and beyond to at 150 meters, we can see that the, the drone gets connected to several base stations because of what I said before, because it has line of sight links to all these base stations here. And the distance actually between the drone at this area here and this base station here was around four or five kilometers. And with this, we should keep in mind that Klagenfurt is also in a mountainous area and there is a lake on this left-hand side, which means that if there were actually some deployed base stations on this area here, then the, we would observe much more. Um, the, now we, I can show actually the handovers that uh, the drone experience. So in these plots, I show handover events with respect to time in seconds during the during the, the during the flight on the ground scenario and up to 150 meters. And there is a we, here we show that there is a handover event when there is a switch between zero and one, and the colors correspond to the PCI. Uh, to the PCI of the cell sector that the drone is connected to. So as you can see here, like uh, in around six minutes, the, there were 
there were somehow like uh, six handovers, which is not which is not a lot. But then when the drone was flying at 150 meters, there were so many more handover events. And here at 100 meters, as you can see, for example, here between zero and 60 seconds, there was what we call a ping pong handover, like a handover between just between two cells. And this is really bad for the network because of all the communication overhead. Uh, I mean, and wh whenever there is a handover, there's a handover switch or a cell switch that impacts uh, that impact the, the the connectivity of the, the user equipment and also the network. So as you can see here, it's I mean the number is really high. So in a nutshell, the, there was one handover per minute for the ground scenario, and there was five handovers per minute when the drone was flying at 150 meters. And the, explain, the explanation uh, of this would actually come from how the from the, the received signal powers. So here, what we what we've done, we actually plot the RSRP, which is the received signal, uh, the, the the received power from the serving base stations and also from the neighboring ones, so that this way we can actually see when there is a handover event. So, for example, for the, for the ground scenario here, we had uh, we had three base stations. I mean, then we. What and what we can see exactly is the fact that these curves are actually well separated, unlike here, and also the these RSRPs, the, the RSRP curves do not have like uh, ab abrupt changes. It's quite stable. I mean, when you compare it to the to the to the rest of the the figures. So here, for example, the drone is. When, it, when the drone is connected to the, to the one that is in black, I mean, it might switch to the one in blue if, it, if the one in blue exceeds the one in black with some hysteresis margin. But you see that the one in red is quite on the low, on the low side. However, when the drone flies at much higher altitudes, at 100 or 150, for example, we can see that actually the, 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 the the base stations to which the drone is actually in line of sight is much is much higher. So here we are, we only had three, but here it was actually uh, I think six or seven. And the RSRP curves are not as stable as the one for the ground scenario. But here you can see if we take any random one, we see that at some point like the RSRP is quite high, at around minus ninety dBm, but then it suddenly plummets to minus 120 before soaring again to minus 90 or minus 80. And this comes from the fact that the drone is, ser the drone is served by the side lobes. So as soon as the drone would leave this area covered by this, the side lobe, which is quite narrow in terms of angle, the, the received signal would drop drastically. And then it's gonna reach again another side lobe from the same base station then the signal is going to rise again. And this is actually one of the main issues that, that we have when the drone is at, uh, at high altitude. Now I'm going to talk, I'm going to give like a, a, of an overview of one application that, that is of high interest, which is uh, using beyond visual line of sight teleoperation for, for drones. So the, here we present like what is the quality of experience for beyond visual line of sight operation. So the idea here is to is that instead of having a drone controller like a, the drone teleoperator directly operating it, operating the drone while having a visual line of sight uh, line of line of sight link and just operating with 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 a joystick or whatever controller is. The idea is to have the operator, let's say, in, in an office or in, in a control center, and the operator would actually receive a video stream from the drone. And the operator will steer this drone based on some command and control. So this is what we mean here by uh, beyond visual line of sight 
teleoperation is having a real-time video stream and also command and control traffic. Uh, there is there are strict requirements for latency and video quality because if the if the if the, if the operator receives a very poor quality of video, it cannot actually steer the drone properly. Or also, if the if these commands that are sent by the by the teleoperator actually are received by the drone with a high latency, then maybe the operation that the that the teleoperator was actually uh, planning would would be actually quite too late or would not be done actually at the at the exact moment in which it should be. So the late for the latency requirements, there are actually two latencies. There is is capture to display latency from the moment the video is captured by the drone to the moment it uh, to the moment it's shown on uh, on a screen for of the teleoperator, and there is also a, what we call the one way network latency, which corresponds only to the to the time that is traveled by the but it's about the, the video stream through the the network LT or 5G until the moment it's received by by the teleoperator uh, device before it's shown on its screen. So we checked what are the requirements and in terms of capture to display latency, it should be under 100 milliseconds and, and the network latency should be uh, below 20 milliseconds. So this is the net, uh, what is of particular focus for us in this part is the network latency that we, that, that we measure and we check whether it's on the acceptable side or not. So for the traffic types, the video is encoded with a variable bitrate and the control traffic is with a constant bitrate, which doesn't involve like large chunks of, of data. And the trade-off here that we need to focus on is the latency versus the video quality. So I mean, if the, if the teleoperator says, okay, I want a 4K video, then okay, he can have this 4K video, but at the latency cost. Uh, unlike what I presented before, this work is based on uh, on simulated work. So this was not an experimental work. So this was uh, work. This this simulation was based on uh, on the NS3 simulator. So the LT system parameter. I'm gonna go very quick uh, very quickly on this. Uh, it was with the the implementation was with this cost had a model for radio propagation a very basic cosine antenna pattern. The scaling was with the pro proportional fare. The 3D UV mobility was uh, with, the, with the Ghost Markov model. And we also had regular mobility and moderate speed or also high mobility in a larger area with high speed and also fast changes of directions. So we compared these two scenarios. And the basically the, the video traffic types were the video stream that is with the variable bitrate and the control and command traffic with this CMPC traffic, which, which is basically a UDP echo. And CMPC refers to control and non payload communication. And that was with a constant bitrate. So the, the video stream is what is basically received by the teleoperator and the CMPC traffic is what is sent by the teleoperator to steer the drone. Here we show some latency figures. So I just wanted to, to keep in mind the, the fact that the acceptable one-way latency or network latency is 20 milliseconds. So here we show what is the CMPC latency and the video latency uh, in two scenarios, regular mobility and high mobility. So for the CMPC, as you can as you can see for the regular mobility, like uh, the it was the color here refers to the to the latency, and here most of the time it was under under twenty, which is no problem for the CNPC. Also, even in high mobility, it's usually again at two, uh, between fifteen and twenty, and at some point it can get a bit beyond twenty, which is still acceptable. However, for the video latency, even for regular mobility, we can see that the the one way latency at instance, like for example, this T is equal to 50 seconds, we can see that it goes already beyond 20 milliseconds. And for the high mobility case, well, it's way beyond that. Most of the most of half of the flight here, 
as you can see, the one-way latency is even beyond 35 and 40 milliseconds, which is absolutely not not acceptable for for steering the drone properly. And then here I just show some statistics on this uh, one-way latency for regular and for high mobility. So again, we had, as I said before, we had the CNPC traffic and the video screen. For the CNPC traffic, at regular mobility, you can see that it's, it's very stable and it's most of the time at 15 milliseconds, which is very good. And for the video stream, it's around 15 milliseconds there are some values that are beyond, but still not beyond 15.4, which is still on the good side. However, when the mobility gets higher, for the CNPC, it's still acceptable. It's still below this 20. I mean, it's not as stable as before, but still acceptable. However, for the video stream in this top right, you can see that there are several outliers that go beyond 20 milliseconds, which means that the latency was not always consistent and it was not always within the acceptable range. So here we focus a bit more on the video quality. and uh, In terms of quality of experience, we check it with the peak signal to noise ratio and also with the structural similar similarity index. Here we show the we showed a PSNR for regular and high mobility and also the, uh, the SSIM. And these quality of experience metrics, actually we checked in the literature to what they correspond. So these sort of, these values here, so let's say when the PSNR is higher than 45, then that, could, that would be considered as an excellent video quality. Then there are values for which it is bad, poor, fair, and good. So as you can see here, for especially for high mobility, uh, almost one third of the one third of the time, the PSNR is actually not on the good side. It's more on bad, poor, or fair, which is not really acceptable because when the when the drone tail operator would receive such video, maybe maybe the mobile operator is not even able to uh, to to determine what this video corresponds for, and thus the the tail operator would not take the the proper uh, the proper reaction and the proper steering of the drone. But for the SSIM, it's most of the time, let's say on the good and excellent side, but still for high mobility, one third of the time it was more on the lower side. So here for safe beyond visual line of sight UAV operation, we observed that there is a high latency for the video stream and several outliers, which is really problematic for safe real-time control. The Control traffic with constant bitrate is less sensitive to mobility, which is uh, which is the good news. But for the video quality with high mobility, only two thirds of the frames were received with good or excellent quality. So the idea is uh, the idea afterwards is to develop methods for maintaining low latency with sufficient video quality towards safe mission critical applications. So here again, we can we show that for. The, the main takeaway here is that when we use uh, a cellular network for steering a drone remotely, it is good in terms of uh, control and command traffic, but it's still not perfect for the video, for, for, for an acceptable video quality. So here we reach some we reach the conclusions. So um, first of all, I'm gonna conclude the part that was presented by, by Christian. So drone systems in general provide interesting design and research challenges. They are heavily dependent on communication uh, because of the, the, the similarities between air to air links and air to ground links. Uh, this usually requires multiple communication interf interfaces for control, for sensing data and, and other application particularities. And due to their 3D mobility, drones have 
a highly varying throughput. So it's promising technology for, me, for a several range of applications if the, if the challenges are, are met. Sorry. Uh, and also to conclude the part of uh, cellular connected drones. So I've shown that uh, the drones achieve an average throughput of few tens of megabits per second on the downlink when they're connected to LTE advance. I mean, or I, I've shown also these uh, amazing downlink figures when it's uh, when it's connected to 5G, but also that that was also a particular case in which there was no interference. So the fact that also drones establish radio links to distant base stations, that's really problematic in terms of interference, in terms of the fact that drones suffer high downlink interference, but they also generate high uplink interference to other drones and to ground users. This causes the, the, the fact that they establish uh, radio links to distant base stations cause a high handover rate, which increase with the height. And also several issues are, are yet to be solved for safe drone teleoperation for cellular networks, which leaves room for industrial level research issues. So this was all from our side. So here I just show you, you can see it later. I, I, I just show some references from which we, from which the this talk was based on. So mostly papers uh, published at Dronet, which is a Mobisys workshop and some other conferences. So that's all from my side. So me and Christian are now ready if you have some questions.